John was, he was born actually in Colorado Springs. Yeah. Uh, and in 1967, yep. so no sign, you didn't come out with a computer, so it wasn't like this. And you know, as Anne mentioned, John was a, a literal uh, child prodigy when it came to programming, was programming an assembly language. It was interesting, by 14, we were talking about this, um, that he was doing this, and he says, no, plenty of kids were programming at 14. <laughs> no, now they are. Now they are, but they're not <laughs> coding an assembly language. I hate to break it to right. you. So this is John Romero. So he, this is his family, um, and what I think is interesting, uh, his, his mother there is sitting on his father's lap. Um, this is actually a really traditional scene that you would see in many Mexican households. Uh, any idea what's happening on the table there? Food, yes, food. <laughs> good idea. So what they're doing? Mexican food. Yeah, they're making tamales. They're on the table. Um, so this, yeah, this is his father Alfonso, for whom John is also named, and his mother Ginny. Um, then if we progress, uh, if we pro we can't progress. Let's see. There we go. So why don't you talk a little bit about where you come from? Uh, Tucson, uh, Arizona, is uh, basically my parents went to Colorado Springs for about five months. And then I was born there, and then they came back to Tucson, where they actually, you know, <laughs> grew up. And um, and so I we lived in a neighborhood. Uh, my my grandmother lived in. It was kind of like the Mexican barrio in Arizona. So it was a really poor area. Um, it was basically right next to the uh, Yaqui uh, Indian Reservation, and um, and you know the whole family is Mexican and living in living in. Uh, in kind of the poor section of Tucson, and we lived maybe a mile away down the street uh, from my grandmother's house, and uh, and I I went to school there. You know, we walked walked to school and um, just kind of grew up kind of in the dirt, uh, in in the <laughs> desert. <laughs> and so, if we just going back just for a second with um, with why, because your family goes to Colorado Springs to have you, if you could, just knowing that we were talking about the future of games being diverse, uh, how is, why did, if you can share why they went there? Uh, well, they were, um, it was, it was, back in the 60s, uh, there was a lot of prejudice, and with my mom, who was a white woman, and my dad, who was Mexican and, uh, and Native, that was like, racism was, was kind of rampant back in uh, Arizona, so they left to go to Colorado to get away from that. And, um, and it was just too hard to make it in Colorado, so then they came back and uh, decided to go back into, uh, go back into the, the, the poor section. So you touched from. a little bit on where your family is from, uh, if, if you want to talk about that, just where your family comes from, Mexico, and I know your mother is also part Cherokee. Yeah, my, uh, on my, on my uh, grandfather's side, he was, uh, on my mom's side, my grandfather was part Cherokee, and on my dad's side, uh, my grandmother was uh, Spanish from Basque, Spain, and my grandfather was a Yaqui uh, Indian from Mexico, the Sonoran region. And uh, so there's a lot of, that's why I have long hair. <laughs> that's where it comes from. Yeah, people ask, what's John's hair secret? And my answer is genetics. Yeah. Um, good luck getting it. And it's, it's sad because you get the comments, you have better nails and you have better hair. <laughs> my makeup, I'm not, my makeup is better than yours. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, a lot of people, you've, interestingly enough, since we moved to Ireland, you get asked a fair bit, I would say maybe once a week, if you are a Native American, uh, and normally you will answer Cherokee, uh, but you are predominantly Yaqui. Right. Yeah, and, and, uh, and Irish people are actually pretty excited to meet uh, someone who is Native American because um, some of the tribes uh, back in, back in the, the famine time uh, helped Ir Ireland, had sent some money and, and I think some help possibly. Yeah, the Cherokee, the Cherokee the, and Choctaw. Or the, yeah, the Choctaw. Um, so, so the, with, with growing up, this is a, an actual shot of the neighborhood where you grew up, if you want to talk a little bit more about, you know, what, um, I don't know that the term barrio is necessarily familiar <laughs> to people, but if you want to talk a little that bit about... That actually looks nicer than it used to. <laughs> That's a more recent picture. Uh, the cars are nicer because they're more modern, but um, yeah, the back of the house is kind of a junkyard. It's, they, they actually have two lots. There's this, this one lot here, and then the the second lot is kind of would have been a, a facing the other road, uh, but my, parent, my grandparents bought it, and my grandfather loved junking, 
So um, he had he had a hole full of uh, dead cars and RVs and, and uh, just all kinds of stuff. And kids, you know, we loved crawling through all that stuff. So you, so this is where you start. There's obviously no computers are happening quite yet. And there were really two possible <laughs> career paths for people in your family. Yep. Yeah, there uh, weren't computers probably in Arizona at that <laughs> back in that time. But working in the mines was, uh, Pima Mining Company was the big mining company in, in, uh, in Arizona, and everybody went to work there. Uh, and my uncles, sometimes, they also sold drugs and worked at the mine, so they had two jobs. <laughs> yeah, so you, yeah, so anyway, uh, just from, from these promising beginnings, um, I, which I'm so grateful you didn't sell, you would have been very good, I'm sure, selling drugs, but also probably not very alive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is your your family as you start growing. You're the you're the uh, the brown-haired little kid there yeah. before the hair gets long. He hasn't cut it since then, apparently. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, this is this is John's family here, and I think there's an interesting thing that an interesting decision that your parents made or your father specifically made. Yeah, my um, just because of the the racism and my my father did not want me to be discriminated against. Uh, he basically did not want me to learn uh, Spanish, so he didn't speak Spanish in the house, uh, around, you know, in our house uh, uh, with my brother and my mom, and, um, and so I never got an accent, which he didn't want me to get an accent, so, uh, so at my grandmother's, everybody spoke Spanish, but, you know, when you hear it every day, when you don't hear it every day at home, that's, that's where it actually uh, is effective, and so we didn't hear it at home. And so my brother and I both don't know Spanish, um, and the rest of the family that talks <laughs> Spanish, like actually Spanglish, where they go in and out of, of English and Spanish all the time. So you move, and now there's an interesting difference between that past slide and how you end up in Rockland. So this is where things in your life, I guess, kind of go from, as you said, you liked playing in dirt. And, <laughs> yeah. And they actually go down a little bit, if you want to talk yeah, about so, that part. Yeah, uh, so in... Uh, my father was an alcoholic, and, uh, and one day he went out to go to the store, and he never came back. And, uh, and so my mother, who had no job, had to figure out what to do. She had to sell the house and, um, and basically get, get a job and get us out of the house and find a place to live. And, and so uh, we had to go through this probably a, a couple of years of transition. And um, she met uh, this guy that uh, was was really smart. He had just uh, he had just retired from the Air Force from 20 years, and had transitioned into a defense contracting role and had started a new career. And she was a bank teller, so she knew he had money. <laughs> <laughs> so she she thought this this guy could probably um, provide pretty well you know, and we could have a good family. So they got married in 1976, and their, uh, their 40th anniversary is on July 4th. So, uh, so And moved us to Rockland, and moved California, to out of Tucson, Arizona, which was a massive uh, improvement. So one of the things, even though it's, so your family still doesn't have, uh, at this point, doesn't have a lot, but there's one thing your, your, your stepfather notices that you are, you are sort of falling in love with computers at this point in time. And so when you are in this, well, there's glasses, man. Um, you, you, grew, you grew into your- <laughs> That was in 1982. I'd, started, I'd been programming for about three years by that time. But I learned how to program by going up to the college, uh, the, the town college when I was 11 years old and uh, on the big mainframe computers like that, and started to learn how to program in basic. Um, and did that in computer stores and anywhere that had a computer. Radio Shack, and uh, until we got a computer in 1982, then I basically stayed in, in inside and never went outside again. <laughs> yeah, so there's the, the computer. So his, his, so your your stepdad comes home with an Apple II, and you were done going outside at that point in time. Yeah. Um, this is the actual computer. Uh, it's now in uh, it's in the National Museum of Play back in the states. So, uh, and it was uh, it was it just an interesting piece of trivia about this. Behind that plaque there with the, the blue stripe on it is a notebook. Oh, oh, actually, it's right in front of the computer, sorry. Yeah. And that notebook, he, he would, when he was in high school, because he was so obsessed with coding, he wouldn't, he, you did very poorly in high school. It's a miracle you made it out. Yeah. And part of the reason was is because he was programming in his notebooks. 
So he was hand assembling code in his notebooks, which I'm sure every normal 14 year old <laughs> does. He's hand assembling code in his notebooks, so when he get home, he could enter it quicker. And needless to say, it, it resulted in him failing a great deal of things. Um, so this is your Apple game design. So now you're obviously starting to get into games here. Can you yeah, I was writing. Um, I was writing this book. That was what that article before was uh, in the in the school newspaper. Was this book that I was writing? Um, and I wrote probably two two books about programming games back in 1982 through 85. And um, and I was just very excited about games. So I just wrote a ton of games. Dozens and dozens of games. And obsessed with the arcade, so you started to make games on your own. And I, and an interesting, another weird piece of trivia about you is he needed special permission to get into the coding class um, when you, you graduated school uh, in England, high school. And they needed special permission. And when he showed up with his code samples, he actually went to work for the aggr aggressor squadron of the, uh, of the Air Force. So who knows what you did. Um, <laughs> and so those, but then you get into the game industry and you're working at Origin Systems. Uh, you do some ports of games for them. But then this is really the time, you know, most of people know you for Doom and Wolfenstein and Quake. And this is really the place with Softdisk where that starts to take shape. Yeah, yeah, after um, I started Softdisk, and this is after my third startup company. Um, I finally went to work at another company and, uh, and kind of put together a group of people um, to make games on a, on a thing called Gamer's Edge. And uh, we, we got together and started making games and it was, uh, it, was, it was amazing because it was the first time that we'd ever worked together, uh, any of us had worked together as a team. So it's John Carmack and Adrian Carmack who are not related and at night, uh, Tom <laughs> Hall would come in from the from the other Apple II area, and um, and help make make stuff. And so we had <clears throat> John Carmack had had created this really amazing technical achievement that had not been seen on a uh, PC computer, even then nine years after the PC had come out. No one had had solved the issue of trying to make the screen move smoothly the way a Nintendo Entertainment System could move. And so uh, one night, uh, they, d Tom and John had made this demo called Dangerous Dave and Copyright Infringement, which basically was replicating Super Mario 3's first level using my character Dangerous Dave. And I came in the next day and I saw the, the demo and ran it, and as soon as the screen moved, scrolled, uh, scrolled <laughs> smoothly, I could not believe what I had just seen, and, and like everything changed at that point. Like, id Software was really born the second I saw that screen move. And so we immediately started writing Super Mario 3 so we could submit it to Nintendo and see if they would want to uh, publish it. And they decided not to publish it, but that was great for us because we decided that we were going to make our own games using that technology. So what, what is in this picture, I, I don't think you, you wouldn't get it from this picture if you didn't know <coughs> you and didn't know some of the things you were looking at. But having no, like I obviously knew you well before we became a couple, uh, as if I would just be like, oh, we're a couple. Hi, nice <laughs> to meet you. Um, but I, we had been friends for years yeah. in, the, in, the, in the industry. And what had always inspired me is you were a kid, like we joke, there's a, there's a group of us who we joke come from the poor kids club. You know, so single parent families or things like that. And the computers you're looking at in this screen are, are, don't belong to you, right? Yeah, we actually didn't even have enough money to have computers. Like we, I had an Apple II computer yeah, but that's a, that was a pretty old computer that I, by this time in this picture, I'd had my computer for five years, and the computers that we're using on the table there are, are PCs, they're 386 computers, and they were from work. Yeah, so we didn't just, actually have enough money to, to buy our own, so we just took them from work and brought them to the house on the weekends <laughs> so we could make our games. So you make uh, Commander Keen 1, 2, and 3, which is, you know, successful, and then you meant, so you, then you guys found, you leave and you found id Software, and you released just a shocking amount of games during that That's time, one you year. know, one, where you really start to, where people, you know, really notice the company, I would say, is with Wolfenstein 3D, right. both for, you know, the potential controversy of it, as well as its success. Um, this is a very flattering photograph of you that I found, um, so included. <laughs> um, and this is you working on Doom here with a, with a beautiful, absolutely beautiful late, uh, early 90s mullet. Um, <laughs> this is why you should never let your wife do these yeah. things. Uh, 
And so then we get, you know, we get to the game for which you're best known, um, obviously, Doom. Yeah. Um, and you could talk endlessly, I know, about Doom. And I, I wanted to add, like, so on this disc, sometimes we'll be going through in our house and I'll find things like this, just sitting in a box. All the source code for the game just yeah. burned on the CD, just tossed somewhere. Yeah, I just tossed somewhere. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing is, like, nobody has what's on that CD. It's like, it's not anywhere. Um, well, that's good to know. <laughs> uh, so this leads to Quake and really the, you know, the founding of, of uh, at this point in time, I guess, founding and cementing of the first-person shooter genre. Um, and now I want to just bring it back to diversity. Um, and for those of you who are like, oh, I want to hear him talk more about Doom and Quake, he's, there's loads of talks on Doom and Quake, too. So your new game that you're working on is Black Room. And what, what is interesting to me about Black Room is how you have actually returned to your roots. Um, so here is, there is a, a last year, uh, there was a Native American in games conference, um, and of which you are looking at all of the speakers, right? Very select group of people. Um, and this is, you know, some pictures, more recent pictures of you with your family in Tucson. Um, in this, unbelievably, we moved to Galway, or sorry, we moved to, du we have moved to Galway, but we come to Dublin, we want to go to a Mexican restaurant. Who owns a Mexican restaurant? Hugo Romero. So there's John and Hugo at Azteca. Uh, but let's talk, if you can just talk very briefly about your character. Yeah, well, the, ma the main character in the new game is a Yaqui Indian. Um, and he is uh, a chief engineer, so he is a STEM-educated Yaqui. And, uh, and he is basically um, working with holographic, like, like a high-tech future holographic simulation technology. So, so not a white guy in a game, not going a back guy, to yeah. your roots, and you can also play a Yaki woman in the game right. as well. Um, also making a game uh, with our son called Gunman Taco Truck, which is his idea. Yeah, it was, it was Donovan's <laughs> idea. Yeah. So, but I think it's just interesting having, you know, returning Taco to your roots. Taco Truck with guns. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I guess, you know, the thing, like, if I get one message from what you have, you know, growing up, you know, definitely in a poor area of town, alcoholic father, you have access to nothing, that code, learning how to code is the great liberator. It was, yeah, that's one way. That was definitely the way that I was able to, um, to learn something that was, that was uh, very rare back in the, back in the day. It was, I, I didn't know any other programmers. It was really hard back in the early 80s when computers were just barely getting into the house to even find someone else to talk to or e to even have books on on programming. So, um, but, it, but getting into doing that uh, was great because it, I'm, I was kind of an exception and people took notice and I was, uh, I was able to um, kind of get, get out there and create things and get published and, and uh, I guess go forward do, doing um, cool things. Really cool stuff, yeah. <laughs> so the message is no matter who you are, no matter where you are, learn how to code. It can change everything. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay. Want to be in the audience next time? Click here for tickets to InspireFest 2017.